they went and did it. The week prescriptions forced a game six, so I'm back. Hamish Hamden here, calling either the Union Jacks championship winning game, or setting up Johnny Paprika to walk you through a winner take all game seven. Either way, it's my last game of the tournament, and as I reflect on the past month, I've learned a lot about baseball. And as good as it is, I think there may be ways to improve this game. One team is always sitting in the dugout, I think maybe there should be a way to have both teams on the field at one time. Uh, of course, that would require two strike zones, so maybe put them at opposite ends of the field? Could let the catcher stand in front of them and guard them, perhaps put a net around the zones to catch any balls that go in, maybe make the catcher the only one that can use his hands, make the ball bigger, perhaps have the players kick it to each other... I don't know, just some ideas, just some ideas. But for now, Game 6, which sees a rematch from our Game 2 starters. Jim McCormick of Union Jacks takes on Rex Barney of the Weak Prescriptions. Game 2 was won by the Jacks, but despite McCormick pitching into the ninth, neither he nor Barney factored into the weird wins and losses stats. Which can we just get rid of? Quality starts is a decent metric, I suppose, but wins and losses? It's a team game, and just because you happen to be on the mound at a particular point in the game, you're credited with winning it for your team? That's like crediting Brazil for winning the Second World War. Yes, they were there, yes, they were important, but come on, they came on in the fifth inning. Johnny's glaring at me, reminding me I'm supposed to be calling a game, so why don't we jump to the bottom of a second? Not to see a run, but to see Brett Butler show off his arm. George Hall launches a deep ball to try and score a sack fly from third, and it's Butler versus Brain. An average brain can go at 60 bits per second, but no one told Dave, and Brett guns him down at the plate. Wait, scratch that, this game's being played in Canada, not America, so no one's getting gunned down. He's just out. You want to see a run? Well, top of the third. Todd breaks the zeal on the scoring, this homer giving the weak prescriptions a 1-0 lead. Barney's been looking good so far, so in the bottom of the third, the Union Jacks try some small ball. McCormick bunts a runner over to second. That's right, one of the highlights that we have picked out to show you is a successful bunt. And that gives the Union Jack some hope. Hope Ferris, that is, and his RBI single ties this game up. Chance for the Union Jacks to put one foot in the winner's circle now as the bases are loaded. But Barney knows Dick Higgum grew up in the 60s and they were... swinging! Down he goes and the game is still tied. What? What? Well, I assume the 1860s were swinging too. Shush. Moving to the fourth, and Bottom Lee is on top of Lee of that pitch and gets on to lead off the inning. Dave Winfield then hits this to the outfield, and beyond! That is the second homer of the day McCormick's given up, and the prescriptions lead 3-1. That was a single followed by a home run. Would you like to see it again? Okay, but it's not a replay. This time it's a Matthews single, followed by a Durham home run. 5-1. That'll be it for McCormick, who can't replicate his outstanding Game 2 outing, but his opposite number Barney's still in for the scripts. We see him here in the bottom of the fourth in a bread and butter chip, or in other words, a bit of a pickle. Runners on the corners, one out. Austin tries to powers this ball, but only succeeds in grounding out. So a run scores, and like an unmasked anti-vaxxer at a school board meeting, the Jacks dangerously remain in touching distance. It's 5-2. I know it's Game 6, I know it's a huge deal, but we at the Dugs want to emulate our heroes at SportsCenter, so let's start skipping important pieces of the action just for the heck of it. We will show you a couple of home runs in the top of the sixth. Piazza's tenth of the postseason is followed by Winfield, and those two solo shots make it 7-2. We won't show you two more RBI singles, even though they're just as important, because we need time for our more important ESPN segment, SEC Football, What Do Bama Players Like On Their Pizza? Bottom of a fifth, and another home run, this time from Bobby Thompson, gets two of those runs back. It's 9-4, but we're not going to show you the sack fly that made it 9-5, because we have to tell you, the Alabama players prefer anchovies. ESPN, home of the SEC and other stuff sometimes. With that out of our system, let's settle back down to baseball, and it's the bottom of the sixth. Ryan Duran is in, the player that was the inspiration for Charlie Sheen's character in Major League with his trademark fit classes, and the inspiration for Charlie Sheen himself with his alcoholism. Fair play to Duran, though. He not only beat alcoholism, but wrote a book about his journey called I Can See Clearly Now, which is such a fantastic title I refuse to take any digs at it, even though he walks Tom Brown on five pitches. Even though he then hits Dave Brick. 
even though he then gives up an RBI double to Dick Higgum. Even though he then gives up a three-run homer to Bobby Thompson. This game is tied. That's Bobby Thompson's second home run in two innings. This man was a chronic overachiever. After retiring from baseball, he went to work for the West Vaco Paper Company, where he was assistant regional man... Oh, sorry, assistant to the regional manager. It means a tension-filled game is coming down to the ninth, and that's where we'll pick things back up. Game 3 starter Danny Cox is in for the Jacks out of their bullpen, but he didn't have much time to warm up, and Cox is stiff early on. He gives up a leadoff single to Bottomley, and now later on Bottomley has made his way to second. There's one out, so a double play could end it. Oh, but no! That's just a fielder's choice as Durham gets on! So can Todd Seal put the prescriptions ahead? Make mine a double, he says. A huge two-out, two-RBI double, and the scripts are on the verge of a game seven. So it comes down to this. Bottom of the ninth. We have two on, we have one out. One swing of the bat could end it and give the Jacks the title. Bobby Thompson has homered twice. Can he make it three? No! The strikeout heard round the world! It's all down to Ed Cogswell now, who is desperately hoping to get a second sentence in his Wikipedia entry. But he won't do it like that! That's a ground out! That's a game ender! That's a second win in a row for the weak prescriptions, and that's a setup for a game seven! Johnny! There is a whole host of stats on the screen right now, but the only one that matters is this series is tied 3 3. To everyone who has watched all these videos, thank you. To Johnny, you started this, you created this series, it's time for you to end it. Take me out to that ball game, Johnny, and tell me. Who's going to be playing Beck, and who's going to be playing Queen? Here we go! First year of the Dogs in the inaugural championship comes down to the winner of a single game. Bring me my blacklight posters because the drama is high as shit. We're jumping right in. In the bottom of the first, the Union Jacks get on the board as Dave Brain hits into a fielder's choice, scoring one. And as we advance to the bottom of the third inning, it's Dave Brain again, singling to load the bases with one out. Dick Higgins up with a huge chance, but he sends a grounder to the pitcher and they're able to get the force out at home. So it comes down to Bobby Thompson to pick up his teammates and that is the shot heard by absolutely nobody. Final chance of the inning strikes out. In the top of the fourth inning, it's the weak prescriptions turn. Brett Butler still second with ease to put a man in scoring position. Mike Piazza is up next, and he's probably the last person I'd want to face. He singles and ties the game for his 20th RBI of the postseason. We are tied up at one. The Union Jacks attempt an answer. Who misses deliberately offensive? We're playing small ball with a bunt out of Chalmers to advance the runner to second. And say what you will about the small ball, like it's not a man's game and no one paid for their ticket to see a bunt, and if you gave Rambo a bat, do you think he'd bunt? But Hugh Nickel doubles to score. It's 2-1 Union Jacks as he pays the bunt off. In the bottom of the fifth inning, Dick Higgum says, enough small balls. That is a two-run home run to make it 4-1. We might be seeing a little bit of a redemption story for Higgum as he hits the biggest home run in his career. After his playing career was over, he became an umpire, setting the groundwork for his previous claim to fame of being the first and only umpire to have ever been banned from the game permanently over suspicions of rigging games. Quite the accomplishment when you consider Joe West has managed to stay in the game since 1976. Here he is, photographed with his best friend, a log. We're back into the action in the bottom of the sixth. The first two Union Jacks of the inning have walked because that's what the weak prescriptions do on the mound, and Hugh Nichols singles to load the bases with nobody out. Hobie Ferris stays bigger than the moment and singles scoring two. It's 6-1 Union Jacks. Tom Brown follows with another single, making it 7-1. The Jacks are running away with it. George Chalmers has done his job, but he has to come out of the game at only 96 pitches. With a self-contained tournament, our teams have predominantly gone with the balls applied directly to the wall strategy and have made liberal use of their pitchers. Prior to this Game 7 start, Chalmers started Game 4 as well, throwing 122 pitches in a complete game, and prior to that, he came in to close out Game 2, going an inning and a third. So Jim Wright comes into the game, and he's a fresh arm. Maybe a little too overfresh. It's been 12 days since we've seen him, as his last appearance came in the prior round of the playoffs. Uh-oh. 
First thing he does is give up a triple. Ray Durham manages to bring him home on an RBI single, but that's all they're going to get. So not bad, Jim Wright. Jacks are six outs away and five runs up. Well, Jacks were five runs up. It's the top of the eighth and like someone sticking their butt out at Dick Cheney, Dave Winfield unleashes a moonshot in the top of the eighth. That goes for three runs and things are getting interesting. It's a two run ball game at 7-5. That's where our score stands entering the ninth inning. The Jacks bring Chris Reed into pitch to try and close it out in the ninth. He's appeared three times prior in the series, going less than an inning each time, but he has not been charged with any runs as of yet. Zeal grounds out. They're two outs away. But it's not going to be that easy. Luzinski and Butler hit back-to-back -back singles down 3-1 in the series. Down 7-1 in this game. Can the weak prescriptions come back again? And who comes up? Of course it's Derek Jeter. This guy is no stranger to the postseason. He's the current record holder for games played, plate appearances, at-bats, hits, singles, doubles, triples, runs scored, total bases, and strikeouts in the postseason. He's third in home runs, fourth in RBIs, fifth in walks, and sixth in stolen bases. And another accomplishment to the file. That's a RBI double and we are tied. Mike Piazza following and he's sitting on 20 RBIs this postseason. He walks. Probably not a terrible idea. Jim Bottomley flies out, and so we've got two down. The last chance for the Scripps to take care of business right here and now. And they do! Dave Winfield singles and the weak prescriptions with two outs and the ninth have their first lead of the game. Gary Matthews follows and he's got a full count against him. Hey Junior, look at your daddy play! Matthews doubles to score an additional two runs. From 7-1 down to 10-7 up, the weak prescriptions have taken the game over. And now it's the Union Jets down to their last three outs, needing three runs to tie. It was right there for them in their grasp, but the season isn't over yet. George Hall leads off with a single. Many of the Jacks fans have turned their top hats inside out to spark a rally. And that's a good start. Harry Smith is called out on strikes for out number one. Ed Cogswell goes down swinging, and the weak prescriptions are one out away from the title. Hugh Nichols sends a ground ball out to second. That should do it. And it does! The weak prescriptions are champions of Doug season one. The team has swarmed the field. Not known for their coordination, several of the players have tripped on their way out, but everybody appears to be okay. They go undefeated in the group stage and complete one of the most dramatic comebacks in a series in a game that I've had the pleasure of witnessing. Season one is going to be tough to top. Let's wrap this one up. Dave Winfield came up huge going four for five with his fifth home run of the postseason, four RBIs and three runs. He had the three-run home run to make it a game again in the eighth, and then hit the single in the ninth that gave the prescriptions their first lead. Derek Jeter's two RBI game-tying double in the ninth was his first hit of the game, and on the other side, poor George Chalmers. He gave it his all, pitching for the third time in the series, including his second start on short rest, and set the table going six innings and only allowing two hits with nine strikeouts. Irish McElveen and Chris Reed must prefer eating with their hands and face because they flipped the set table and gave up eight earned runs in an inning and a third. So the sun has set on the first ever experimental baseball tournament. What'd you guys think? We'd love to see comments on the channel or wherever you get your dunks. If you're excited to see season two, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel on YouTube. We're going to come back and wrap this season up as well as give you a look at what our plans are for the second season. Until then, for Hamish, I've been Johnny Paprika hoping all your balls are fair and all your wood is good. Good night, everybody.